Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Ginger Rogers and Frederick March in Bachelor Mother with Frank Albertson. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. To the young ladies of our modern business world, the lunch hour means a great deal more than just lunch. It may mean a shopping trip, a visit to the hairdresser, a rendezvous, or perhaps an unexpected adventure. And during a lunch hour, the alert young businesswoman is prepared for almost anything to happen. But Miss Polly Parrish, in our play, Bachelor Mother, was just minding her own business when something happened that not only upset her lunch hour, but changed her whole life. One thing led to another in such a gay series of adventures that RKO's picture, Bachelor Mother, turned out to be one of the comedy hits of the year. Although taken by surprise, the modern young woman of our story knew exactly what course to follow. In fact, we take our hats off to the resourcefulness of our modern girls in general. Consider the example sent to me by a member of our audience. It's a clipping from the Birmingham, Alabama News, in which a resourceful young lady advertises, girl in need of work at once will consider dishwashing if Lux is used. <laughs> I'll make a bet she got a job with a wise employer. When Lux Flakes is in the dishpan, both Judy O'Grady and the Colonel's Lady are sisters in the care of their skin. For the role of the modern young Miss Polly Parrish in Bachelor Mother, our choice was the modern young Miss Ginger Rogers, who played the part with typical uh, ginger and wit on the screen. She comes to us from the set of the new RKO picture, Primrose Path. As David Merlin, the son of Polly's employer, we plan to have Joel McRae. But Joel was taken ill during the week, and I'm glad to report that he's improving rapidly, and that Frederick March returned to Hollywood just in time to play this role. We've been, <laughs> we've been trying to get Freddie back to our microphone for a long time, but a stage engagement in New York held him there. This week, he begins a new MGM picture, Susan and God, and tonight you'll hear him as David Merlin. I suggest now that you move up to the edge of your chair as we raise the curtain on Act One of this gay and exciting comedy, Bachelor Mother, starring Ginger Rogers as Polly Parrish and Frederick March as David Merlin, with Frank Albertson of the screencast as Frank Miller. <laughs> Polly Parrish, young and pretty, is about to lose her job. This is hard enough to face at any time, but when it happens on the day before Christmas, it's almost too much. During her lunch hour, Polly Parrish walks slowly along a street in downtown New York. Vaguely, she wonders what's to become of her. As she passes the Atkins home for foundlings, fate steps in. <laughs> steps in, gallops in, for a woman in a heavy shawl is just leaving a bundle at the door. With a gasp of indignation, Polly rushes to the woman and catches her by the arm. Here, here. Here, don't you dare. Why, don't you dare leave your baby. Please, I'm not the baby's mother. There is no mother. They'll take good care of it here. Just the same, you have no right to do I such I thought a... I could take care of it after the mother died, but I couldn't. Oh, it's such a wonderful baby. They'll be good to it. Wait. Hey, come back here. Come back. Oh. Oh, you poor little kid. All alone. Now, don't cry, darling. Here, I'll hold you. Oh, Would you come in? Oh. What? Oh, just come this way, please. Oh, take your finger out of your mouth. There, now, now don't eat your finger. You hungry? Well, they'll give you something to eat here. That's a good baby. Right here, please. Uh, Another one, Mr. Fry. Oh, yes. Oh, your sweet. name, please? Poor little thing. So. Your, your name, please. Polly Parrish. Come on, take your finger out of your mouth. Are you employed anywhere? <laughs> I'm at Merlin's until tomorrow. You darling, you. That's a good baby. Now, just uh, not... why did you abandon your baby, <laughs> Mrs. Parrish? It's such a sweet... What? Oh, well, this isn't my baby. I, it was on the doorstep. Yes, yes, we... <laughs> we know. Well, no, really. Well, 
An old lady left it on the doorstep, and I, I, I thought it'd roll uh, my off. My dear, so I... we're only here to help you. We're your friends. Well, I wish it was mine, but it isn't. I wasn't leaving it. I, I was just picking it up. Uh, many mothers say babies are not their own, but from experience, we've discovered the wisest thing is to make a clean breast of it. Now look here. This is ridiculous. This is not my baby, whether you believe it or not. Here, nurse, you take the baby. I'm getting out of here. You see, my dear? When you give the baby to the nurse, it's right. Take it back. Just for a moment. There. Well, my dear. Oh, for heaven's sake. The baby seems to know you. Well, I don't know it. Here, you take it. No, no, no. No, let me alone. When I want a family, I'll get married and do it right. Oh, it's pathetic, isn't it? Well, anyway, we know she works at the Merlin department store. Mr. Merlin and his son have always been very charitable. I'll go right over there after lunch. Sit down, Mr. Fry. Now, what can I do for you? You are Mr. Merlin, sir. Mr. Merlin the Younger. Ooh. Was it my uh, father you wanted to see? Oh, no, no. I'm, I'm sure you can take care of this. Well? Uh, Mr. Merlin, an employee of yours, a young woman in the toy department, uh, left a baby at the Atkins home today. Oh, I see. And I discovered, on calling your personnel manager, that she was discharged as of tomorrow. Well, she was probably only hired for the holiday rush. Exactly. But I believe the loss of her position is the reason she has abandoned her baby son. Mr. Marlin, give her back her job. Well, this is really very unfortunate. What's her name? Uh, Parrish, Polly Parrish. Uh, Mr. Marlin, if you had seen this mother denying the parenthood of her own child, it would have touched your heart. Excuse me. Uh, hello, Miss Wilson. Call the toy department and have a girl named... Uh, uh, Parrish. Uh, Parrish. Sent up here at once. Oh, it was pitiful, Mr. Merlin, to see the child crying as soon as it left her arms and stopping its crying as it returned to the bosom where it rightfully belonged. Yes, pitiful. And as you may know, it's the home's policy not merely to care for unwanted babies, but to make possible, if possible, the return of the baby to its mother. I think we can arrange that, Mr. Fry. As a matter of fact, I'm almost sure of it. When the girl understands... Good afternoon, madam. Can I interest you in a mechanical duck? You see, it winds up with a key and it No, must... Henry's much too old for that. Hiya, Polly. How's the girl? Hitting on all six? Hello. Hey, no kidding now, Polly. What are you getting me for Christmas, huh? You wouldn't drink it. <laughs> oh, what a day, Ma. She's crazy for me. Go away. Will you get that hand truck moving and bring back some more ducks? We're running low. Oh, now, take it easy. I've been pushing that truck overtime. Say, Polly, I saw you hooping at the employee's ball, and you got it, babe. Think so? Uh, I'll prove it to you. We're going dancing tonight. But I don't feel like it. Is it worth uh, $50? You mean you're going to give me $50? Well, not exactly. No, listen. There's a dance contest at the Blue Heaven. Now, the orchestra leader is one of the judges, and he's my best pal. The prize is 50 bucks, and we split it up the middle. Uh, cheese it. Here comes a floor walker. What do you say? You just made a deal. I'll be around to pick you up after dinner. Miss Parrish? Miss Parrish. Uh, yes, Mr. Hargraves. Uh, Miss Parrish, you are wanted in Mr. Merlin's office. Mr. Merlin. At once, please. I don't know why. Uh, Mr. Merlin? Oh, yes, come in. Come in. Oh. Won't you sit down, Mrs. Uh... Uh, Miss Parrish? Oh, Miss, Miss Parrish. That's right. Oh, well. Uh, did you receive a card today saying that you were discharged as of the end of this week? Yes, I did. Well, it was a mistake. Will you excuse us? It won't happen again. The job is yours for as long as you care to have it. Huh? Uh, what do you say, Miss Parrish? Well, well, thank you. Well, thank you very much. And you're being raised $5 a week, starting as of last week. Is that satisfactory? What do you say, Miss Parrish? Oh, thank you. You're, you're quite welcome. But merely getting your job back and an increase is not your real Christmas present. No? No, no. Your Christmas present is probably the greatest gift a woman could possibly have. I, I almost envy you. Yes, I, I do envy you. Really? Oh, you fortunate girl to have an employer like Mr. Merlin. Yes, but I don't... When you go home tonight, you'll get your Christmas present. Tonight, Mr. Fry? Tonight. Tonight. Fine. You, uh, you may go back to your department now, Miss Parrish. Oh, thank you. 
Thank you very much. And I want to wish you and yours a very, very Merry Christmas. Well, thank you. And same to you. Yes. Good day. Good day. Good day. A nice-looking girl like that. Ah, uh, yes, it's a funny world. I can just see the look on that girl's face tonight. Yes. Yes, so can I. Wait a second, wait a second. I told you, seven o'clock... Merry Christmas, Miss Parrish. Well, what do you want here? I brought your baby. Uh -huh. Uh, what? Here you are, my dear. Your Christmas present from John B. Merlin and Son. Christmas present? And what do you say, Miss Parrish? Well, I'll tell you what I say. You take that baby right out of here in this minute. What? Do you realize what you're saying? I certainly do. That's not my baby, and you can just take it back to the foundling home where it belongs. Do you understand that Mr. Merlin has given you your job back, that you can raise your child in security and comfort, and you are choosing instead to let it be raised as an orphan without a mother's love? This is not my baby! I am not its mother! No, oh, for shame, for shame, acting like this. Take your baby and be happy. Good night, Miss Parrish. Wait! This baby will be back at the foundling home before you get there. I wouldn't try that if I were you, and there's no use le leaving it elsewhere either, because it'll come back to us, and we have its footprints. Oh, well, the nerve. Oh, you have... oh, oh, I'm sorry, kid. Oh, well, gee, this is nothing personal. Gee, I'd love to have you around, but I I couldn't do right by you. Well, come on now. Now, you don't want your teeth to grow in there crooked, do you? No. Come on, take your fingers out, please. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, who is it? Hi, Paul. Oh, this is Frank, the well-dressed man from the toy department. Oh, my. Oh, oh, one minute. Oh, just a minute. Now, look, kid. I'm going to hide you behind the sofa. Now, you just stay there, and don't you make a sound, do you hear? All right, all right. Just a minute. Hiya, sugar. Oh. Hello. Well, well, what a layout. <sighs> Look, Frank, I'm sorry. I, I won't be able to go with you tonight. I, I think I'm going to have a headache. Oh, now, wait a second, baby. You can't do that to the chief. Stand up the old maestro. Why, everything's all set. My brother, let me have his car. It's champing at the curb right this minute. Yeah, well, I'm really awfully sorry, but... Uh, Something's come up. Oh, now, you just listen to the old doctor, honey. Everything's fixed. The orchestra leader's a pal of mine. I just spoke to him on the phone, as a matter of fact, and... Hey, that's funny. I thought I heard a baby crying. Oh, oh well, go on, Frank. Well, so I talked to him, and it's in the bag. So you talked to him, and what did he say? Well, he, he says he's got it all fixed. Hey, listen. I do hear a baby crying. Oh, that. That's next door. Yes, it keeps me awake sometimes, so I think I'll go out of my mind. Oh, that's tough. Oh, yes. Uh... <laughs> you know, it, it sounds like it's right over here behind the... Holy mackerel! Look! It, it's a baby. A live baby. Well, what of it? Well, what did it do? Crawl through the wall? Don't be silly. Is it, uh, Is it yours? No, it's not mine. Well, well where did it come from? I got it for Christmas. Oh. Huh? This Christmas or last Christmas? Now, listen. I don't know what you're thinking, but you're all wrong. Oh, oh sure, And if you'll sure, wait until I get my sure. hat and coat on, we'll go stepping. Oh, well, now, look. If you've got a headache or if you think you might have one, well, just don't, don't bother. Don't worry. It's all cured, and I've got another little situation to cure when we're on our way. Come on, baby. Hey, wait a minute. You're taking that along with us? Certainly. I've got a little errand to do. We're just gonna drop it off someplace. Come on. Oh, listen, this is worse than a blind date. I didn't figure... Pull up over there, Frank. Hey, you certainly picked a nice place anyway. Come to the door with me, will you, Frank? Okay. Uh, is this where the baby lives? From now on, it does. Pretty fancy, all right. Ring the bell, will you? Okay. Goodbye, baby. You certainly are cute. Gee, isn't this a cute thing? Yeah. <laughs> well, why don't they answer the door? <sighs> Good evening. Oh, uh, good evening. Is Mr. Merlin in? The, the son. I'd like to... I'd like to see him. Merlin? Hey, Shut would up. You, would you tell me in reference to what? Well, it's a personal matter. He'll know what it's about when he sees me. Well, madam, he's not in just now. Uh, couldn't you write him a letter? 
Well, I can't take care of this baby. After all, it's his responsibility, and, and he's got influence, and he got me into this fix. He can just get me out. I'm, I'm very sorry, madam. Good evening. Oh, no, you don't. Take this baby. Look here, madam, I... I oh, just put your hand under its back. That's right. But, but, but wait a minute, madam. You, you can't do I this. I just did. Come on, let's get going, Frank. Yeah, let's. Well, here we are. Yeah, back home and broke. I'm sorry we didn't win that prize, Polly. Oh, forget it. My friend double-crossed me. Yeah. Well, thanks for bringing me home. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Uh, say to Polly, how about giving a fellow a little drinking, huh? Sorry, I, I haven't any liquor here. Well, then, how about letting a fellow in for a smoke? I haven't any cigarettes, oh, either. Oh, well, I've got the cigarettes. I only need a match. Now, Frank, it's pretty late, and I have to get up early. All I want is a match. You could give a guy a match, can't you? One little match. <laughs> that never hurt you. One little match. Come on. Frank, Come get on. out of here. <laughs> oh, stop. Get stop. out. Get out. <laughs> who, who said that? I did. <laughs> Go on. Get out of here. Mr. Merlin. Mr. Did you hear me? Uh, yes, sir. Sure. I, I just... Uh... Good night, Mr. Merlin. Well, Mr. Merlin, how did you get into my apartment? The landlady was kind enough to let me, uh, to let us in out of the cold. I've been here three hours. Us? Yes, us. You'll find your child right there on the chair. But I tell you that... Miss Parrish, I followed you tonight, and I came back here to ask you just one question. What possibly could be going on in that peculiar brain of yours that lets you jump around a dance floor like an idiot ten minutes after you've left your child in a strange home with strange people who, for all you know, could strangle it. Are you through? No. I've seen some low things in my time, but a mother who's just abandoned her child going out to enter a dance contest, <laughs> that will stand alone in my memory as something revolting. I thought that was pretty revolting myself. Are you interested in knowing what I'm going to do? Would it interest you to know that I am not the mother of that child? And that, to me, is the lowest thing of all. To deny your own child when it cries as it leaves your arms. Those people have experience. They know a real mother when they see one. I'm going to fire you. In fact, you are fired. But that's nothing. I am not the mother of that child. Fine, fine. You're not the mother. As you go from place to place looking for employment, you will discover that no department store in the mm. entire Merchants of America Association will hire you. I'll see to that. But that's nothing. Any employer will ask you for a character effort. In my wildest imagination, I cannot conceive of anyone with a character less deserving of a reference than you. I'll explain your character. Why? That's persecution. Yes, I'll say it is. What? And eventually, you'll come and you'll plead for your job back. And then you'll realize what a privilege it is to have security and a chance to raise your child yourself. What? You danced, yes. Well, now you pay the, pi the, the, the fiddler fellow. The... You have an obligation to that child. You fulfill it. Well... You made up your mind to ask for your job back? Or are you going to starve a while first? Well, I... Uh, well, I'll take my job back. Well, that's better. I'm only doing this for your own good, Miss Parrish. As the years go by, you'll realize what a terrible thing I've saved you from doing. But I'm really not as bad as you think. Well, then why did you do it? Well, I had to. There was no one I could turn to. Oh. oh, I see. Well, but isn't there some legal way to make the father support the baby? Oh, I, I don't want anything to do with him. Oh, I see. He used to beat me. No. Yeah. See that scar on my head? Where? The coffee pot. He threw it at me. Oh. You poor kid. Yeah. Well, uh, well, I'll be going now. You, you'd better get some sleep. And don't worry about anything, Miss Parrish. This store is behind you. Thank you, Mr. Merlin. So that's all right. Good night. Good night. Well, baby, what do we do now? <laughs> Have you got any suggestions? Gurgle, huh? That's fine. Well, I'll think about that. In the meantime, well, thanks for the job, anyway. Mr. 
Mr. DeMille brings us Ginger Rogers, Frederick March, and Frank Albertson in Act Two of Bachelor Mother in just a moment. Suppose someone asked you to illustrate speed. How would you do it? One way is with music, a fast, lively tune like this on the xylophone. <laughs> That expresses musically the marvelous speed of new quick lux. It's really amazing how fast it is. An added ingredient speeds up the action of lux flakes, so you get suds in a second. Try it yourself and see. Just pour out the delicate tissue-thin flakes and turn on the water. Then watch the suds bubble up. Those suds come so fast, it's amazing. In water as cool as your hand, new quick lux dissolves three times as fast as any of 10 other leading soaps tested. New Quick Lux is not only wonderfully fast, it's thrifty. Ounce for ounce, it gives you more suds than any of the other soaps tested. That's true even in hard water. There are, there are no builders or fillers in New Quick Lux. It's rich, pure soap. Have you tried it yet? Well, your grocer has New Quick Lux now in the same familiar box at no extra cost to you. Women who've used it are so enthusiastic, they keep saying... I didn't think Lux Flakes could be improved. They've always been so wonderful. But now, they're even better than ever. Don't delay another day. Buy new Quick Lux tomorrow for all your washables and your dishes. Get the generous big box. Now our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act Two of Bachelor Mother, starring Ginger Rogers as Polly Parrish and Frederick March as David Merlin, with Frank Albertson as Frank Miller. Two days have passed, and with them, of course, two nights. Silent, restful nights, interrupted only by the constant screeching of Polly's adopted baby. Back at her job in the toy department, Polly is still winding up ducks. But her heart isn't really in her work. Her eyes are half closed from lack of sleep, and she moves slowly as in a dream. Well, well, well. Good morning, Polly, my girl. Good morning. Don't talk too loud. You wake me up. Why, what's the matter? Haven't you been sleeping? Not for two nights. How long can a person go without sleep, Frank? Oh, Polly, listen. You, you can trust me. I'm the kind of a guy, you know, see nothing, say nothing. How about putting in a good word for me with, uh, you know, uh, upstairs? What's the matter with you? Well, the assistant floor walker job is open right in this department. Mm -hmm. With that little carnation and everything. Mm -hmm. Now, one word from you, and I stop pushing this silly wagon around. What do you say? Miller, get that truck out of the aisle. Uh, yes, sir, right away. Don't let me catch you talking again, Miller. Converse in your own time, not on the stores. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, ex excuse me, Mr. Hargraves. And Miss Parrish, keep those ducks in motion, please. Yes, sir. Morning, Hargraves. Oh, uh, good morning, good morning. Uh, uh, quite an honor having you visit our department, sir. Oh, not at all, thank you. Thank uh, you. Any special reason, sir? Oh, no, no. Uh, yes, yes, matter of fact, the new uh, assistant floor walker. I wrote you a memo about it. It's to be a man by the name of... Uh, well, I can't think of it right now, but he's entitled to promotion by seniority. Uh, Frank Miller, sir? Yes, that's it. Unless you have some personal objection. Oh, no, sir, no. I I'll tell him now, I'll tell him now, sir. He'll be very happy, sir. <coughs> uh, good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine. I can hear you all right, but I can't see you so good. I haven't been sleeping for two nights. Why not? The baby's been crying. Is it sick? No, it's just being a baby. Well, why don't you have it sleep on its stomach? I read that someplace. That's how they sleep. Do you know how to get a baby to sleep on its stomach? You turn it on its stomach, and then you go to bed. And then the baby turns over and starts to cry, and then you get up and turn the baby over, and then you go to bed again, and then the baby turns over and starts to cry again, and then you get up and turn it on its stomach, and pretty soon it's 9 o'clock and you're winding ducks. Well, but uh, don't any mothers sleep? I'm beginning to think they don't. Well, you'll get on to it. It's a natural instinct. So sleep. Well, then how, how are you managing? Who, who takes care of the baby while you work? My landlady. She knows all about babies, thank heaven. Oh, well, there can't be much to it. <laughs> After all, every, everybody here was a baby, and they all got through it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll think about that. 
That suppose that all mothers put on that it's so difficult raising a child. <laughs> I, I saw through that when I was six years old. <laughs> I'll think about that, too. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good morning. Good morning. Come on now, baby. Come on and eat your dinner. Yeah. See the pretty duck? Now you watch the duck and you eat your dinner and before you... Come in. Hello. Oh, well, hello. I, I was uh, walking through the book department and I saw this book, How to Bring Up Your Baby Scientifically, by Dr. Uh, Ernest Eggelman. Greatest thing I ever read. Everything you have to know is, is right in here. You mean a doctor would know more about a baby than its own mother with her natural instincts? Well, this is scientific and includes the instincts, too. All right, come on, baby, just eat your dinner. Hey, Go right no, ahead. No, wait a minute, just... wait a minute. How do you know you're doing that right? Doing what right? Feeding it. Oh, well, there's nothing scientific in this. The baby opens his mouth and I put the food in it and he swallows it. <laughs> From then on, he's on his own. Ah, oh, well, that's what you think. We'll just have a look at the feeding. Feeding, feeding with an F here. Ah, there, here we are. Now, listen. After the food is prepared, the mother will, A, get a spoon. Wonderful how he ever thought of that. Don't be so smart. Just do as it says. Spoon. I've got it. And warm it to room temperature. Warm it. I did. How? I put it under the warm water. Well, that may not be right. I, I think it has to be sterilized. Well, well, anyway, B... Take a spoonful of food and, uh, just a second, place on a piece of gauze. <laughs> you a, uh, a piece of gauze? What for? Will you please do as the book says? All right, but I still think no, it's No, no, please, of... it's just possible, you know, that a, a doctor with 20 years of experience knows what he's talking about. All right, go ahead, next. And gently rub into the navel. What's that? What? And, uh, gently rub into the navel. Oh, that's ridiculous. Well, no, no, it, it isn't. No, that's, uh, well, that, that's probably to adjust the temperature of the baby's stomach to the food. <laughs> but I, uh, I, I think it's very logical. Well, I never heard of such a thing. Here, let me see that. Well, I read very well, you know. I've done it for years. Yes, I read little, too. Let me see. Begins let me see. right here, in the bottom of this page. Oh, yeah. Take a spoonful of food and place on a piece of gauze and gently rub into the navel. Huh? You, you read very well. Well, I don't believe it. I don't care what it says. Now, don't make out that you know more than a doctor in a printed book on the subject. I know I'm not rubbing any oatmeal into this baby's navel. <laughs> Who is this Dr. Eaglefoot, anyway? This book is... is it's, oh, look. What's the matter? The pages were stuck together. Well, what do you think of that? Just listen. To relieve gas on child's stomach, take a spoonful of warm oil and place on a piece of gauze and gently rub into the navel. Oh, oh isn't that funny? <laughs> mm -hmm, it certainly is. If the page had said, hang baby by neck, you'd thought it very scientific. I'll feed the baby my own way. Come on, baby, now eat your dinner. You know, somebody could real... sue the store for a thing like it's that. It's a good baby. You might wind the duck, Mr. Worland, if you've got nothing better to do. Well, you know, just Come because on, those pages stuck together, there's no reason to condemn that book entirely. Okay. Well, that's fine. Now you've broke it. Well, it's a, it's a defective duck. Could it be that you wound it too hard? I just wound it normally. This is inferior merchandise. Where'd you buy this duck? John B. Merlin and son. Oh. Well, that's all right. It's still inferior. Out of 10,000 ducks, one or two can be less than perfect. That's what we have an exchange department for. Just have it exchanged tomorrow. Ha, ha. What's the ha, ha for? Nothing. Just ha, ha. What's the matter with our exchange department? I only work for you. We never resent criticism. We appreciate it. You won't get angry. Certainly not. What's the matter with our exchange department? They won't exchange anything. 
Oh, they won't, eh? Hey? They only exchanged $60,000 worth of goods last year. You don't have to overdo that flip attitude about the store. It isn't very cute. Just have that exchange tomorrow. No, I'll just throw it away and buy a new one. Well, I'll exchange it for you. Give it to me. Oh, sure. You could probably get exchanged for a grand piano. I'll show you I can have it exchanged without anybody recognizing me. I'll, I'll wear dark glasses. I'll disguise myself. And I'll have a new duck for you by, by 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. What do you think of that? Come on, girls. No leaning against the counters. Here, pick up that paper. Straighten those boxes. Okay. Take it easy, Frank. Mr. Miller to you. I'm the assistant floor walker now. Yes, Mr. Miller. Well, that's better. There's going to be a few changes around here. Come on, come on. No gossiping there. Break it up. Break it up. Oh, uh, Miss Parrish. Hello. How do I look? <laughs> I'd never have recognized you. No, they, they won't know me. Would you, uh, would you mind escorting me to the exchange department? Right over here. Just speak to the gentleman behind the counter. He'll take care of you. I'll have this duck exchanged in exactly one minute, and courteously. Here we are. Go ahead. <coughs> I, uh... <laughs> I have a duck here. I'd like to, uh... Just a minute. Just a minute, please. Oh, of course. Of course. Well, what do you want, please? Well, I, uh... I have a duck here I'd like to have exchanged. Certainly, sir. What's your complaint? <laughs> it's, it's broken. Oh, I can see that. How did it happen to break? What difference does it make? I have to know where to place the responsibility. Oh, well, just place the responsibility on the duck and give me a new one. Hmm. May I see the sales slip? Oh, just a minute. Have you got the sales slip? I threw it away. You should have kept it. I, uh, I threw it away. You should have kept it. How did I know the duck was going to break? Well, how did I know the duck was going to break? It's clearly printed on the slip that it's to be kept for 30 days. You can't expect me to keep a sales slip for everything I buy. You can't expect me to keep a slip for everything I buy. My house would be full of them. My house would be full of them. I'm sorry, sir. I don't make the rules for the store. They're made by the executive office. I don't care anything about the executive office. I want another duck. Well, you're not going to get it by shouting. That's what you think. I'm exchanging it for a new duck, and you straighten it out any way you like. Give me that duck. I'll show him. Hey, you, where are you going with that duck? Get out of my way. Oh, a shoplifter, huh? Hey, come here. Frank, in. stop. He, he... Let go of me. Oh, I got you red-handed. Is you here when I... Hey, Mac, shoplifter, shoplifter, come on. Will you let me... Where is he? Okay, I got him. Trying to get away with a duck. Let me uh... go. I'm David Merlin. Mr. Merlin? Oh, excuse me, Mr. Merlin. Merlin, oh. Come here, you. I didn't know it was you, Mr. Merlin. I, I, I thought it was a customer. A customer, eh? You're lucky it was me. A customer at Sue the store. How long have you had this job? Well, you know, since yesterday. What did you do before that? I was a stock clerk. Well, I've got a little secret to tell you. You're still a stock clerk. Get a new assistant, Hargraves. Oh, Mr. Miller, you've disgraced the toy department. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're broadcasting from the heart of Times Square, surrounded by thousands of persons waiting to usher in the new year just three short hours away. Listen to that crowd. Who is it? Man from John B. Merlin and Son. Oh, oh well, it's you. Here you are, madam. Your duck. I exchanged it. No trouble at all. <laughs> oh, well... Come in. I certainly didn't expect to see you tonight. Well, I didn't expect to come here. I was taking my shower, and it suddenly occurred to me you must be having kind of a shabby New Year's. You get dressed. We're going to a swell party. Stood up, huh? 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 You were stood up. Well, uh, I just told her I'd call back, and then I forgot to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. Well, I'd like to go, but I just can't leave the baby alone. Oh, uh, the baby, the baby... You don't have to devote your whole life to the baby. That's what you told me to do. Well, it's New Year's Eve. Get somebody to take care of it. Get, get the landlady to take care oh, of it. Oh, wait, there's, there's something else. What? Well, me in a sweater and skirt and you with a... We'd make half of a very lovely couple. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. I'll, I'll take care of the clothes. Yes, how? Stop at the store. Everything you need. Oh. Dress, shoes, ermine wrap. You'll be beautiful. Oh, but... Oh, but look, these people, you're... You're, you know, your friends. I don't know how to talk to those people. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. You just say no to the men, and the, uh, the girls won't talk to you anyway. Come on. Uh, 
Ah, this is where I live. Yes, I know. Well, it's been a grand night. See, I've had a wonderful time. So have I. <laughs> I can't ever remember a better one. Thank you, sir. Well, good night. Good night. Oh, say. Yes? I was just thinking, don't people usually, uh, I mean, on New Year's, don't people usually exchange greetings? You know. <laughs> yes, usually. That's what I thought. I mean, there were a lot of them back at that party. Remember, they were yeah, sir. kissing each yeah, other. <laughs> <laughs> sort of a, and it's silly, isn't it? <laughs> Is it? No. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Well? Oh, good night. Oh, you'd better take this coat back. I, I don't want to keep it over Sunday. Well, nothing can happen to it. You wear it and bring it into the store when you come in. All right. Thanks. Well, say, look, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's just 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock? Mm-hmm. In Chicago. <laughs> See, they, uh, they exchange greetings there, too, you know. <laughs> Happy New Year in Chicago, Polly. The same to you. You uh, wouldn't want to stay up and welcome in the New Year in Los Angeles. <laughs> well, it's pretty late. Good night. You know what we ought to do tomorrow? Why don't we uh, take a long drive in the country? Oh, that would be wonderful. Oh, but don't you think it'd be a little too cold for the baby? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the baby. Yeah, that's what I thought. Well, if you want to see us, we'll be in the park all day tomorrow. And... Well, I don't know if I can make it, but I'll try. <laughs> well, thanks again for a very wonderful evening. Good night. Hello, Miss Parrish. Oh, Mrs. Wise, thank you so much for minding the baby. Oh, it's <laughs> nothing, nothing. Looks so cute he is. Why, he's awake. You waited up for me, didn't you, baby? <laughs> he wanted to see if I'd come home early, didn't you? <laughs> he's such a good baby. He didn't cry even once. My Jerome, he's just now 31, used to cry all the time. <laughs> well, thank you again, Mrs. Weiss. I didn't think I'd be out this late, though. And oh, I... it's nothing. <laughs> what else have I got to do? <laughs> Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Oh, is that so? Listen, baby. I I think he likes me. Or maybe maybe it's just that I'm hoping. But baby, I don't think he likes you. <laughs> well now don't frown. Nobody's gonna come between us. No, sir. No, because you're my fella. Good night, darling. And happy new year. After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille will return with Ginger Rogers, Frederick March, and Frank Albertson for Act Three of Bachelor Mother. Men are interested in science. Women, in beauty. I want to tell you about a most remarkable scientific test made recently in New York, which has a lot to do with beauty, with the loveliness of a woman's hands. Now, every woman knows that coarse, harsh hands, the kind we call housework hands, are unpleasant to look at. And while everyone admires the woman who does her own housework, Nobody admires rough, red hands. That is why clever women who cook and wash dishes don't let their hands shout, drudge. They've discovered by actual experience that gentle, new, quick lux for dishes leaves hands lovely. Now comes scientific proof of the wonderful mildness and gentleness of new, quick lux, a series of tests conducted by scientists in a laboratory. To this laboratory came hundreds of women, and each made a one-hand test. She put one hand in Lux suds and the other hand in suds from another soap. She dipped her hands in and out of the suds for 20 minutes, three times a day. In some cases, for as many as 27 days. Now, mind you, these women didn't know what soaps were being tested. And they didn't use any creams or lotions on their hands during the test. Conditions were similar to home dishwashing. And they were equal for each of five leading soaps, including Lux, used in the test. Well, sir, when this exhaustive test was over, there was no doubt about the result. It clearly demonstrated that Lux was kindest to those hands, 
in case after case, the Lux hand looked smooth, soft, and lovely, while the other hand looked rough, red, and unattractive. Now think of it. The same woman, one hand embarrassingly rough, the other charming as ever, thanks to gentle Lux. Now this convincing test, the most dramatic test ever made of dishwashing soaps, merely confirms scientifically what so many women know, that with gentle, new, quick Lux, free from harmful alkali, you can wash dishes, and do other soap and water jobs you must do every day without having rough red hands. So why not do this tomorrow? Get a big box of new Quick Lux Flakes at your grocer's and use it for your dishwashing. Prove for yourself how lovely and soft and feminine it leaves your hands. It's so gentle. And it's speedy, too, and truly thrifty. Yet it costs you no more. We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. We continue with the third act of Bachelor Mother. The meetings in the park have become a Sunday ritual with Polly and David, and of course, the founding child. But now a new character enters our story. The personification of dignity and breeding, a frock-coated, silk-hatted gentleman, known to the Merlin employees as old J.B., and to David Merlin as Dad. On a certain Sunday morning, Frank Miller, brooding over the loss of his job, has slipped a note into old J.B.'s car. On his way home from church, J.B. reads it. Dear Mr. J.B. Merlin, this is to let you know that you are a grandfather. Hmm? If you don't believe me, just ask your son and a certain girl whose name I won't mention because I am not a rat. They go to the park every Sunday and wheel the baby. How do you like that, you stuffed shirt, a friend? Good Lord! A grandfather! Jones! Jones! Yes, Mr. Merlin? We're not going home yet. Drive through the park. No, no, you mustn't try to sit up, baby. <laughs> there, that's a good boy. Look at him. Isn't he, darling? Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, you've come a long way from the girl who wouldn't even admit it was her own child. You think it's quite a baby now, don't you? Well, you get used to it. You get used to anything if it's around long enough. But this is an unusual baby. Really, it is. Oh, I don't know. I guess it's heredity. Oh, yes? Mm. Why, what's the matter with me? Oh, nothing. What about the other 50%? Oh, him. Well, if there's anything in heredity, the baby ought to be able to play a wonderful piano. That's quite a quality, yes. He might also get to be the world's best coffee pot thrower. Now, that was unnecessary. After all, you don't know the circumstances. Maybe I was to oh, blame. Well, never mind. Let's not discuss it. It's none of my business, and I haven't any interest in it anyway. Good morning, David. But, Dad, what are you doing here? Just strolling around, my boy. Just strolling around. Polly, this is my father. Uh, this is Miss Parrish. How do you do? How do you do? And who is this? Oh, well, this is uh, Miss Parrish's little boy. A boy? Uh, would you mind, Miss Parrish, if I was very careful, would you let me hold him just for a moment? Of course. Thank you. Come to your grand... Oh. Come to me, little fellow. Oh. There, there, there. Oh, he's wonderful, isn't he? I'd know that chin anywhere. Oh. Why? What's his name, Miss Parrish? Oh, uh, John. John. Well, thanks for that, anyway. Is there something I can do for you? No, no, you've done it, my girl. Here, go to your mother, John. Well, thank you. I, um, I wouldn't keep the baby out much longer. I, I think it's getting chilly. Dad, you're acting very strangely. What's the matter? I'll discuss this with you at home. Goodbye, miss. Goodbye. I'll expect you home in an hour, David. What's the matter with him? I don't... Oh, holy mackerel. He thinks that he... Uh... I'll see you later, Polly. Dad! Dad, wait! Now listen, Dad. I want to tell Quiet. you... Quiet! Quiet! I'll do the talking.
talking. Twenty years I've been waiting, waiting, waiting. What do you think for? Why was I living? What was I looking forward to? So this is the modern generation. So this is the 20th century. Dad, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, don't you? Well, marriage was good enough for your father and mother, bless her. And it's good enough for you. What? Young man, you're going to marry that girl. You're going to bring my grandson into this house. Well, now I've got something to tell you. Now, don't you start with me. You know my temper. Remember what I did to Governor Meade. Listen, you haven't any grandson. Don't deny it. The least you can do is not deny it. I saw him with my own eyes. I saw you with a girl. I saw you wheeling the baby. That's not my baby. The least you can do is not deny it. I... I have other information. A letter from a friend. And if I didn't have it, if I never saw you wheeling him, if I saw that baby on a desert island by himself, I'd know it was my grandson. Why, he looks exactly like me. Dad, for heaven's sake, you're jumping to conclusions. I, uh, I figured out what to do. My mind's made up. Nobody is playing around with my grandchild. I'm taking it, and I'll get it if I have to go to the Supreme Court. I'll take it now, and you try to get it back. Will you listen, Dad, before your blood pressure goes through the ceiling? Never you mind my blood pressure. You don't know me in a fight. You're the stubbornest person I ever saw in my whole life. I'll prove to you it's not my child. Oh, you're crazy. That's what's the matter with you. You're, you're unbalanced. You've worked too hard, and your mind's cracked under it. What you need is a vacation. Take a vacation in Florida. <laughs> I'd like to see him try it. He can't take that baby away from me. You don't know him, Polly. He's sending for lawyers and investigators. Well, he can't do it. The baby belongs to me. Well, we've got to stop all him. All right, all right. But if you could dig up the piano player, it'd be a big help. Well, I can't do that. Well, you'll have to. I mean, when half a dozen lawyers walk in here questioning your fitness to raise a baby... Look, so take me to your father. Let me talk to him. I'll convince him. Well, he won't believe you, either. He's, he's gone off his head. He, he even wanted me to marry you. Oh. He... He wanted to set me up with a ready-made family so he'd have a grandson. I, I tell you, it's serious. Yes, yes. Uh, I would be serious marrying me. Oh, no, I didn't mean that. I, I just... Would I... you please go? Well, I didn't realize how that sounded. Oh, I, it I... doesn't matter. All that matters is that you tell your father to leave Johnny and me alone. Well, I'll... I'll do what I can, Polly. Will you please go? Now. I'm sorry, Polly. I, oh, I, get out! <laughs> Come in. Well, how long, Miss Parrish? Hello, Mrs. Weiss. Come in, come in. You know my son, Jerome. Oh, sure, sure. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Mrs. Weiss, would you help me pack? I'm going away. Away? Where? Well, I don't know, someplace. They're trying to take the baby away from me. Who is? Uh, that their fellow just went out? No, his father. He's the pop of the baby. No, but his father thinks he is. Well, that's ridiculous. Now, I don't pretend to be an attorney, but I know your rights, and I say he can't do it. Well, he'll send people to ask questions, and that's just as bad. Polly, darling, why don't you get the real papa to go to his father, huh? I can't. I wish I could. Sure, that would be the solution. Wait, 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 I'm thinking. Jerome. If you could be the papa, just for a little while... Huh? What? That's it. That's it. Mama! Jerome, this is your chance to do a good deed. But, Mama! Your, your name's Miller, isn't it? Frank Miller? Oh, yes, sir. That's me, Mr. Miller. Let me in. I had a hard job finding you. Mr. Merlin, if you came about that note, I didn't mean to make any trouble. What, what note? Oh, uh, oh n nothing. Listen, listen, Miller. Do you know who the father of that baby is? Huh? Who is the father? Well, I don't know anything, Mr. Merlin. Nothing at all. You don't? You sure? No, sir. I, I don't know. All right. Look, would you like to be an assistant floor walker again? Would I? Then I can fix it for you. Miller... This is your chance to do a good deed. Beg pardon, Mr. Merlin. Well, well, what is it? There are two people to see you, sir. A Mr. and Mrs. Jerome Weiss. Weiss? Never heard of them. Tell them to write a letter. It's about a baby, sir. A baby? Well, well, send them in, send them in. Yes, sir. This way, please. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, won't you sit down? Thank you. Mr. and Mrs. Weiss, eh? 
I thought you were Miss. Miss Parrish. Well, that's the name I use in the store. Uh, Jerome and I have been married for two years. Yeah, that's right. That's, uh, two years. <laughs> Your son just called, and well, there seems to be a misunderstanding about our baby. Your baby, Mr. Weiss? Uh-huh. Hey, so, yeah. So there's no need you're sending anybody to investigate the baby. It's only a waste of time. His baby. It's as though there had been a death in the family. <laughs> I can't believe it. All right, Miller. Right in here. Sure. David, what is this? Well, Dad, maybe this will convince you. <laughs> this man I brought with me is Frank Miller, the father of that baby. Oh. Really? Oh, that's right, Mr. Merle, and I'm the father. Uh, you see, my wife's a very nervous woman, and, and your son just came over to our flat and, and said you had the wrong impression about my son. Well, my son is my son, and nobody else's. Why, I never heard of such a thing. And I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't send any investigators around to make trouble for us. Just a moment. David, do you know who this other man is? No, who? This is the father she brought around, Mr. Jerome Weiss. So you finally showed up, did you? Uh, 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 well, well, I couldn't come any sooner. Oh, that was pretty cute, running out on her like that. Come here. You know what this is? Yes, sir. It's a silver service. I mean, it's a coffee pot. Yeah, you ought to recognize it. You give your wife scars on the head, eh? Well, here's one for you. Oh! How do you like that, piano player? You keep your hands off of him. Don't oh, you touch him. Oh, it's all right. Him. You go ahead and stick up stop, for him. Stop, stop, yeah. stop. You might as well cut all this out. It doesn't convince me. And I'm not through with you, Mr. Miller. I'm going to prosecute you for, for something. <laughs> Mr. Merlin, your son made me do this. I'll tell you the truth, and I know what I'm talking about. Your son is the father. Dad, this is the truth. Now listen, that man Weiss is the father. I'm not the father. I don't care who the father is. I'm the grandfather. <laughs> now wait. Now wait. I'll straighten this whole thing out. Now listen, Polly. Polly. Where is she? She's gone. Gone? She'll take the baby. Catch her. Stop that girl. Oh, Lord. Uh, sorry I gummed you up, Mr. Merlin, but a guy's got to think quick. He does, eh? Sure, got to use the old bean. Well, you use it now. Ooh! Open this door. Open it, I say. I'll never open it. Get away. All right, and I'll break it down. No. You're not going to get this baby. Polly, listen. I'm, I'm not trying to take your baby from you. Since you threw me out this afternoon, you, you don't know what I've been going through. I thought I was only doing all this because I, I wanted to help you. But then I, I realized it's because I'm, I'm in love with you. You sound as if you mean it. But I'll tell you one thing. I'm not going to give up this baby. Where is he? Where's my son? Ha! Ha! I knew I'd find you here. Dad... I want to confess something. I am the father of that child. Well, those are the first true words that have passed your lips in 48 hours. Where's the baby? Come on, Johnny. Uh, We're going home. Uh -huh. Yes, uh -huh. yes, uh -huh. yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> going bye-bye. Yes, sir. You and Grandpa. David. David, did you mean what you said before? Yes. And... You're willing to spend your life with a ready-made family? If the family is you and Johnny. And I've got a surprise for you, Polly. We're getting married tonight. Oh. You, you still think I'm the mother of that baby? Well, certainly. Ha, ha. <laughs> In just a moment, our stars return for their curtain calls. But first, a word to women who want their hands to stay lovely looking in spite of dishwashing. Remember the one-hand tests? They've proved how kind these gentle flakes are to your hands. Yes, and it's just as gentle to your nice things, too. Well, that reminds me, Sally. Will you read what Mrs. Mayton Britton of New York wrote? I'd be glad to. She says, New Quick Lux leaves my sweaters as soft as a kitten. They look perfectly lovely. I've been using Lux flakes for years for my sweaters silks, and other nice things. I didn't dream it could be improved, but somehow you've done it. New Quick Lux is amazing. It's so fast. It's thrifty, too. And it has the same marvelous gentleness Lux has always had. 
Now there are three good reasons for using new Quick Lux. Count them on your fingers. So fast? Why, well, you get suds in a second. A little goes so far, it's thrifty to use. And new Quick Lux is so very, very safe for everything safe in water alone. Yet you don't pay a single cent more for this wonderful new Quick Lux. Your grocer has it now in the same familiar box. Buy a big box tomorrow for your stockings, underthings, blouses, dresses, and sweaters, for your very nice things, and for your everyday things, too, to keep them new-looking longer. And now, Mr. DeMille is bringing our stars to the microphone. Having brought Bachelor Mother to the happiest of happy endings, Ginger Rogers and Frederick March are all smiles as they report for their curtain call. Ginger, I hope you don't always get into trouble when you try to help somebody as you did in the play. <laughs> well, once in New York, an old lady dropped her handbag in the subway, and I tried to pick it up for her, and she threatened to have me arrested. Really? <laughs> well, I don't think you look like a pickpocket. Why, Freddie, that's the nicest compliment I've had this morning, this <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> no, seriously, though, there's, there's nothing like a good turn to brighten up the day. Well, like most good ideas, I believe that's in Shakespeare. How far <laughs> that little candle throws his beams. So shines a good deed in a naughty world. Is he quoting it right, Freddie? Don't look at me. <laughs> Mr. DeMille's a former Shakespearean actor. Oh, well, in that case, we'll give him an A on tonight's lesson. I'll give you both plus A on tonight's performance. Well, we certainly are grateful to you, Freddie, for stepping in and saving the show at the last minute. And I know you and Mr. DeMille join me in wishing the very speediest, re speediest of recovery to Mr. Joel McRae. <laughs> and now I think it's time for Mr. DeMille to give us a report on what he's planned for next week. We've planned a play for next Monday night, Ginger. It'll keep us busy all week. We're especially proud of both play and stars. The play is Intermezzo, and our stars will be Herbert Marshall, Ingrid Bergman, and Gail Patrick. Intermezzo is the unusual love story of a genius. On the screen, it introduced Ingrid Bergman to American picture audiences. And next Monday night, we introduce her to American radio audiences when she joins Herbert Marshall and Gail Patrick in Intermezzo. Well, even for the world's biggest theater, CB, that's a big event. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, Mr. Good night. Good night. You know, there's a lot more applause for you, too, that you can't hear. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Herbert Marshall, Ingrid Bergman, Gail Patrick in Intermezzo. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> Heard in tonight's play were Lou Merrill as J.B. Murdoch, B. Benaderet as Mrs. Weiss, Emery Parnell as investigator, Edward Marr as Jerome, Martha Wentworth as matron, Ralph Sedan as Hargraves, Thomas Mills as butler, Kenneth Lawton as clerk, Walter White as detective, and Celeste Rush, Audrey Reynolds, and Frank Martin. Ginger Rogers' forthcoming picture is RKO Gregory LaCavra production, Primrose Path. Frank Albertson is now working in the MGM picture, Hooray, I'm Alive. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. We're happy to announce that the radio editors of the United States and Canada have just voted the Lux Radio Theater their favorite dramatic program in the poll conducted by Radio Daily, as well as the recent poll conducted by the New York World Telegram. May we remind you that the March of Dimes has begun. You can help to stamp out infantile paralysis by joining the march. Get a birthday card from the President's Birthday Committee in care of your radio station. And if you can't, mail the President your dimes anyway to help fight this terrible disease. Your dimes and those of your neighbors will help crippled children to walk again. Your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>